I knew Vito for about 30 years or something. And I've met hundreds of people during that time who knew Vito. And I've never once met anybody who had a bad thing to say about Vito Russo. Not a bitchy, not a mean. Vito was one of the most beloved people in our gay community. And I, that's a pretty almost impossible order. <laughs> But he, but he did it. He was a wonderful man, a great activist, scholar, writer, um, AIDS survivor, uh, all, all of those things. So how did these books happen? Why did they... So when Jeffrey was making this film and had to pull all of the material together, he and an assistant actually found every piece, of, just about every piece of writing that Vito ever did. And Vito wrote for a, a huge array of publications here in, in America and in England. They found them all and they categorized them all. And then the film was done and he said, what do we do with this? So Jeffrey is my friend and neighbor and he knows I'm a book person. So he came and said, what do we do with this? And I said, well, it just so happens that I'm associated with a small gay press that does books specifically targeted for to preserve gay wisdom and culture. That's a press called White Crane Books, and it's run by uh, Bill Young. So we decided to put the book in that series, and we started to work. We did it, a Bo is in upstate New York. Jeffrey and I are here in Las Vegas, so every Thursday we have a conference call and begin to organize the material. And after just a couple of these, we said, wait, we've got way too much for a book. Not, this can't all fit into one book. So kind of like the Matrix, we said, <laughs> we'll have the red book, and we'll have the green book, all right? <laughs> and the, the first book, the green book, is uh, all of uh, Vito's showbiz and movie writing. It's brilliant, brilliant, and very entertaining. And the second book, the red book, is uh, his more political writing and his essays. Let me introduce to you um, our extraordinarily talented, fabulous, kind, thoughtful, well, what more good things can I say about Mr. Jeffrey Schwartz? <laughs> Actually, did not know Vito. One of the people in the front row that did not know Vito, but I feel like I do now. Um, I actually, after reading the Cellular Closet in the early '90s when I was coming out, I found out they were making a documentary based on the book, and I called Rob Epstein and Jeffrey Friedman, the directors, and I said, "I'd do anything to work on this movie. I'll sweep the floors, whatever you need." And I ended up working on that as my first job in the movie business. And that's when I really got to know Vito because he had he'd been gone maybe a couple of years by that point. But I had access to all of his original research materials and all of his inter extensive interviews that Robin Jeffrey did with him where he told his entire story of uh, growing up gay and falling in love with the movies and then getting angry at the movies or, you know, being so unfair to gay people. And, of course, his uh, AIDS activism during the AIDS crisis. So I'm going to read something that's, um, that Vito wrote on the 10th anniversary of Stonewall. And he wrote it for Gay News London. And I, this was a weekly, so it probably appeared in Gay News London, and that, that was it. So if you didn't happen to pick up this newspaper in June of 1979, you never would have read this. And it's a long piece. But I'm just reading one section of it, uh, which is about Vito's encountering Stonewall, literally stumbling upon Stonewall. So I'm not an actor, so I'm <laughs> unlike these guys. <clears throat> so forgive me. OK. It's called Still Outlaws. And this is in Vito's voice. When I ambled down Christopher Street one balmy June night and spotted a large crowd outside the stone wall, I was pissed off. I was missing something. Besides, I'd spent the better part of the afternoon and evening waiting in line to view the body of Judy Garland, which lay in its uh, white dress at Frank Campbell's funeral chapel on Madison Avenue. I was in a very snippy mood. But it wasn't the death of good old Judy or even the full moon which caused all the trouble that night. Something snapped outside the stone wall which had been at the breaking point all winter. There had been raids on almost every ghetto bar, and street gays had been driven from place to place like cattle. Summer was suddenly bringing people out of hiding. They were children of the 60s, informed by the anti-war movement, the, women, the women's movement, and the student movement. 
There was a rebellious quality about gays which had never surfaced before. The police just picked the wrong night to raid yet another ghetto bar. When I arrived in front of the stone wall, the atmosphere was still quite festive. Various personages of grand demeanor and exotic affectation were exiting the premises to the whistles and cheers of a large gathering. It was a good show. Gay's answering back to the police was unique, but it was also so camp, and it seemed harmless. I was still enjoying this spectacle when I realized that the crowd was not having a good time. I remember someone yelling, why don't you people leave us alone for a change? It was a question I'd had too, but I never thought to shout it in the street. And then I saw that gays were not simply exiting, they were being escorted to police vans and taken off to jail. They didn't often arrest customers, preferring usually to squeeze the management. This was a real first-class operation. I sat that night in the low branch of an elm tree and watched a riot happen. Hearing gay people talk back for the first time had startled me. I moved back into the crowd, afraid, and found refuge in a high place from which I could watch the action. It looked like real trouble to me. Gays on the sidewalk were throwing things at the police. They threw nickels and pennies, then rocks and cobblestones from the street. There weren't enough police to handle what was happening. A raid like this one was routine and had never met open resistance before. Chief Inspector Seymour Pine, who led the raid, was caught in the barrage along with several of his men, and Howard Smith, a writer from the Village Voice. The group retreated into the stone wall, closing the doors against the advancing crowd. People threw bottles. Someone kicked open the doors and threw a flaming piece of paper inside. It was at this point, said Smith's later report in The Voice, that the police inside drew their guns and Pine shouted, I'll shoot the first motherfucker who comes through that door. I heard the sirens which held, this, which held his fire. The reinforcements swept the crowd back into Sheridan Square. I climbed out of the tree and went to. I threw nothing and I shouted no slogans. Like Aunt Pity Pat and Gone with the Wind, I grabbed a smelling salt and hitched up the buggy as soon as the Yankees reached Atlanta. Most of the people I knew did not fight back. I was in the majority of the curious but timid who lent numbers to the brave few who dared act. But I came up each night to Sheridan Square that weekend. I sat on the front steps along Christopher Street and listened to the talk. We would sit for as long as it was safe, and spotting a police car would either move along or stage a confrontation. Most of us had a great mouth on our shoulders in those days, and there were many spirited exchanges, but we did move along eventually. There were leaflets on the streets, and an organized reaction was emerging, but it did not yet reach me. I was still slinging hash and dancing around the fringes of the battle. Like most people, I just wanted to be left alone. I wanted the right to face exploitation in a fire trap without having to worry about a vice cop spilling my drink. A few months later, they raided the snake pit. This time they arrested 167 customers who were herded into a large room at the police station and held for hours. Diego Vinales, a 23-year-old Argentine in the United States on a visa, panicked at some point during the night. During deportation, he tried to escape by jumping from a two-story window. Vinales landed on a spiked fence and lay near death for three weeks in St. Vincent's Hospital. On Christopher Street, I was handed a leaflet. It said, no matter how you look at it, Diego Vinales was pushed. This time, the organized reaction reached me. If they would shoot us in the streets for coming out of the closet, it couldn't be any worse than being forced to jump out of a window to stay in. I joined the Gay Activist Alliance, which met three blocks away from my Chelsea apartment. I also decided to get a master's degree in film history from NYU. I worked in restaurants during the day, went to class three nights a week, and spent all my other time shouting slogans and throwing things. In 1971, I got a job at After Dark Magazine and took a house on Fire Island with six other GAA members. We named our cottage Gay and Proud after rejecting There Goes the Neighborhood is too subtle. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, After Dark turned out to be in the dark. I lasted only five months. One day I kissed a lunch date goodbye in the office. I was later warned by a fellow gay employee, you shouldn't kiss Steve when he comes here. You don't shit where you eat. Now I knew what that was from watching Shirley MacLaine hang herself in the children's hour so many times. Back to the ghetto, I was a waiter again. Thanks.